a haunted niece, a man in black, and a cult of Thorn. The story of Halloween in the 80s and 90s is the story of a franchise returning to prominence and quickly losing its way. But what seemed like the end of the road for Michael Myers and Laurie Strode was rebooted with a fresh perspective for modern horror only a few years later. Unfortunately, the story of Halloween H2O 20 years later in Halloween Resurrection is the story of a series doing a speedrun of the Thorn trilogy's arc of success to failure. In what wouldn't be the last time, the team behind the Halloween franchise found that they had completely painted themselves into a corner, with a series of films that made increasingly extreme choices, only resulting in increasingly poor receptions. And the one way forward was to wipe away the past. The result was a 20th anniversary film in 1998 that brought back original star Jamie Lee Curtis and a sequel that truly buried the franchise in 2002. At the time, it was the chance for Halloween to return to the top of horror, only to wind up squarely at the bottom. Decades later, and the choice to wipe away a huge portion of the franchise is common practice, both in the Halloween franchise and for any series trying to recapture a fan base. So what went wrong so fast? This is the story of Halloween H2O and Resurrection, the modern rebirth and death of Michael Myers. As we discussed in my video about the Thorn trilogy, the big success of Halloween 4 caused producer Mustafa Akkad to immediately greenlight a sequel, with The Revenge of Michael Myers hitting theaters less than one year later. However, the poor fan reception and disappointing box office immediately stalled out the franchise once again, eventually leading to The Curse of Michael Myers in 1995. But by the time this cult-centered troubled production hit theaters, horror had largely moved past the town of Haddonfield, as the early 90s became a directionless time for the genre. The Halloween rights had only recently been bought by Dimension Films, but Curse of Michael Myers had placed the franchise squarely at a dead end. So with no reason to carry on the story, the <sighs> Weinsteins looked to revamp the series. The immediate first step was to bring back Jamie Lee Curtis, gone after two and killed off in the backstory of four. Of course, these things can always be explained away. And Curtis had planned to return with Halloween co-creators John Carpenter and Deborah Hill. But Carpenter's demand for a high paycheck as director was denied, leading to the pair leaving. There was briefly consideration of a script titled Blood Ties by Robert Zappia. But the future of Halloween and horror itself quickly changed when Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven's Scream exploded into theaters in 1996. Scream was produced by Dimension Films, a label within Miramax controlled by <sighs> the Weinsteins. And with Scream a massive hit, Williamson soon signed a deal that led to him writing a seven-page treatment for what was at the time simply known as Halloween 7. The treatment has all the major plot points that would appear in the final product, including Laurie changing her identity to Carrie Tate, running a private school, dealing with alcoholism, and trying to protect her son from a returning Michael. However, there are several major elements that never made it to screen. Overall, Williamson's treatment is a much bigger production than the final film, as a massive Halloween party is held at the school instead of everyone leaving on a field trip. Lori's son is a huge jerk to her and is caught in a love triangle. Both girls that like him die. A huge helicopter crash kills Lori's love interest. A climactic scene has Michael take out an entire police squadron in a dark mountain tunnel. And Lori and her son finally kill Michael with a helicopter's propellers, dicing him into chunks. Keep that ending in mind as it was the definitive death of Michael Myers that brought Curtis back, and Mustafa Akkad's contractual agreement that Myers couldn't die that came to define H2O and its sequel. What's also important to note is that this version keeps the previous films in canon, referencing the events of the Thorn trilogy and the death of Laurie's daughter while she lived in hiding. What Williamson and company were proposing was a soft reset designed around getting Curtis to return, after swearing off the franchise for decades. Once Curtis had officially signed on, Williamson's treatment was turned into a full script titled The Revenge of Laurie Strode by Robert Zappia, and director Steve Miner, most famous for Friday's the 13th parts 2 and 3, came on. And here's where the problems begin. The cast and crew were unhappy with Zappia's script, so Dimension brought Williamson back for a page one rewrite just as filming began. 
clocking in at 86 minutes including a 10 minute prologue, a lengthy title sequence, and credits, H2O is a pretty sparse story, and much slimmer than originally intended, as Williamson eliminated a concurrent detective storyline and any references to the Thorn trilogy. The removal happened so late that actor Charles S. Dutton had already been cast for a part that never got in front of the cameras. As a result, H2O is like 65 minutes long. Overall, I like this seventh Halloween movie, but I don't love it. Miner's movie is kind of sleepy, with the first two acts more focused on Laurie's trauma and relationships than any real slasher action. Of course, the classic slasher tends to balance teen drama with killings, but H2O really holds back on the blood and guts in general. The result is a film that feels like an odd intersection between the new post-scream wave, where everything was a little more self-aware and styled like a teen TV drama, and the nostalgia necessary for the return of a horror icon and an iconic iconic final girl. Just look at Janet Lee's inclusion. As Jamie Lee Curtis's mom and iconic star of Psycho, her inclusion here is a wink at educated viewers, but doesn't serve much purpose beyond that in a movie that is played pretty straight. H2O is just so much more focused on adult drama than you would ever expect. Laurie's alcoholism is a real focus for much of the movie, and unlike the Laurie of the David Gordon Green reboot, H2O's Laurie has been shattered by her experience and has never really brought all the pieces back together again, essentially on the run from her past, her brother, and herself for 20 years. H2O is a pretty low-key affair overall, and as a result, actually feels more in line with Carpenter's original. The 1978 film is restrained in its scares and violence, but created fear through an iconic boogeyman brought into a modern suburban community. Without many slashers to compete with, it didn't need wild and graphic kills. H2O comes on the other side of 20 years, after several slasher resurgences and declines. The post scream boom didn't rely on as much blood and guts as previous slasher waves. Instead, these could almost be classified as dramas, mysteries, or thrillers, until the bodies started dropping close to the end. And beyond its opening, there's really only three casualties at Michael's hands. Again, not much different from Carpenter's original, but a sharp contrast against the rampaging shape of Curse. Props to Adam Arkin selling that blade in the back like Abyss in a TNA thumbtack match. Overall, H2O is also well shot by Miner and cinematographer Darren Okada, although it's moved to California, with the town of La Puente standing in for the fictional Summer Glen, doesn't exactly have the fall aesthetic we glimpse at its start. It's definitely on purpose. And then again, Pasadena was supposed to be Haddonfield, Illinois in the original, so it's almost a meta wink at this series' nebulous location. But I do miss the much more heavily autumnal look of earlier sequels. H2O is working to echo some elements of the original, but isn't overly indebted to it. The one crucial element that couldn't be brought back, however, is Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis. Pleasance had passed away between the filming and release of Halloween 6, with the film dedicated to him. Wow, what an honor. H2O makes reference to the passing of Loomis, dying while still obsessed with the long-missing Michael. Once again, they both walked off being engulfed in an inferno at the end of 2. There is, however, a very suspicious voiceover by a Pleasance impersonator. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face. And but without Loomis, the film is missing a crucial element, and really, I think every Halloween without Loomis is lacking a vital piece. Loomis is the glue, adding gravitas to the barebone story at hand. Pleasance's monologues give a greater thematic resonance to what's happening. He's the narrator of a spooky story, except that it becomes more and more involved and, of course, unhinged in the process. It's all a big what if that would have never happened, but an H2O with Loomis would have been better. The deleted detective character likely would have fulfilled the role of obsessed pursuer trying to stop Michael before it's too late. And just think of all the cool shit an unhinged Donald Pleasance would have said in 1998, like, No Michael, don't kill LL Cool J, he hasn't made Deep Blue Sea yet. Of course, what we're all here for is the confrontation between Michael and Laurie, with their climactic fight being the selling point of all the marketing. If you know anything about H2O, you know this shot. Really, the whole movie is building to that fight, keeping them apart until deep into its third act. The final fight is pretty strong, with an angry but not trained Laurie going wild on Michael. 
And of course, H2O is most famous for its final moment. With Lori putting a definitive end to her brother in a moment of catharsis no other Halloween provided before. This far into the history of the slasher, and there's a sort of unspoken agreement that the killer, especially in any established franchise, won't actually be dead, opting for either a final attack or just the hint they live again. Unfortunately, I just don't think that Michael is very good here. I know that's strange to say about a killer without emotion or real definition, but he feels way too bland, is shot too boringly, and looks kinda cheap. The mask here is actually four different models, switching from one made by K&B to one made by Stan Winston during shooting. In any case, the one you see most in detail, with its big eye holes and poofy hair, looks bad. An imitation of a memory of the real thing. I just don't think he's scary at all here. And also, there's a brief CGI mask too, the result of a missed shot picked up without the new mask and then CGI'd on. Should've just not picked that one up. Part of Michael being so underwhelming in H2O is due to the performance by Chris Durant, which kind of feels like a pantomime where someone is trying to be intimidating without the appropriate size or framing in the shot. Part of it is due to how Minor depicts the killer, sometimes shooting him very plainly without much mystique beyond some shadows. The result is that Michael is scary because of the reputation built up by previous films, even the ones no longer in canon, and not because of much happening here. He's even kinda chill, sparing this mom and child in the middle of a nowhere restroom and happy to hang out in the background while they scoot one out. Hey, how's it going? Michael's death wouldn't stick, we'll get to that in a minute, but here on its own and at the time of its release, it feels like the franchise finally finding some closure it could never get due to continual sequels and constant changes in direction. It's one of the great horror endings, not just because it gives audiences what they've been denied for years, but because it pays off Laurie's arc of being almost paralyzed by decades of fear, and instead taking decisive action to protect her family and end her terror. It's so clear that this is the entire point of the movie that Laurie's son, played by Josh Hartnett with film history's worst haircut, and his girlfriend, played by Michelle Williams, are just dropped from the final part of the movie. That ending was what brought Curtis back, but it almost didn't happen. Zapia's script ends with Laurie fighting Michael in the school gym, stabbing him with javelins, and sinking him into the pool as the gym floor closes over him. Looking back another 20 years later, Curtis said, The last thing I thought I would ever do is another Halloween movie. H2O was conceived really by me. I'm not titled as a producer on it, but it was my brainchild. It was supposed to end him. That's what we talked about. That's what I signed up for. And it was all going along great. And then I got the script. And it was a vague ending. I kept going back to them like, Hey, I thought we were like ending this. This is vague. Anyway, it turned out that in that moment, there was some contract and you couldn't kill him. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to tease an audience again. And I said to them, okay, if you're gonna do the paramedic ending and it looks like Laurie Strode has ended it, my audience is going to be feeling like it's ended. But you have to pay me a lot of money in the next movie. And you have to kill me in the first 10 minutes of the movie. H2O was one of those cases of right place, right time, with the return of Jamie Lee Curtis to the foundational slasher franchise just as the subgenre came back into mainstream popularity, making this a big deal in theaters. And so H2O was a hit, netting a $75 million box office from its $17 million budget. That's more than the total box office intakes of Halloween's three through six combined. So despite the seemingly definitive end of the film, there was already a contingency plan in place for more Halloweens. And with that, we come to the worst Halloween film ever made. I find the overall Halloween franchise to be this interesting recurring example of a movie series striking gold and then squandering its potential and the goodwill of fans over and over again so fast it'd make Judith Myers spin in her dug up grave. The original Halloween becomes one of the most profitable films ever made, and then Halloween 2 disappoints. Halloween 4 brought Michael back for a small refresh of the central premise, but 5 and 6 quickly lost the plot. H2O to Resurrection to Total Reboot is the fastest decline in the entire history of the franchise, and it really speaks to just how out of step Halloween and its producers had gotten with the horror genre and its fans. Zombies Halloween Reboot made more money than any entry before, but the sequel is odd and alienating, even if I prefer it to the remake. 
and the refresh of the 2018 LEGO sequel paved the way for two extremely polarizing and way less profitable entries in the new trilogy. Horror underwent a huge change in the four years between H2O and Resurrection. In 1998, the post-Scream wave of slashers was in full swing, while J-Horror had begun to make its presence known overseas. By 2002, the Scream slasher was absolutely over. The zombie new wave was kicking off with 28 Days Later, and the new French extremity was now the greater trend abroad. But Mustafa Akkad and the team behind Halloween were looking at a different new trend to latch onto with their next entry. With Survivor, Big Brother, and The Amazing Race all having massive success, reality TV is what would shape the next film. And Halloween Resurrection in 2002 is one of the all-time great examples of a studio being complete dumbasses with a popular property. Directed by Rick Rosenthal, who made Halloween 2, and written by Larry Brand and Sean Hood, Halloween Resurrection follows a group of reality show contestants staying the night in the old Myers house. But how is Michael back and what happened to Lori? Resurrection opens with a 16-minute prologue, once again cannibalizing its runtime and main story. This time, the opening sequence explains how we could possibly even have another movie after H2O, picking up three years later with Laurie in a mental institution, and the reveal that Michael had switched places with a paramedic whose throat he crushed. So really, Laurie had beheaded an innocent man and lost her mind in the aftermath. The flashback reveal was actually shot the day after principal photography wrapped on H2O. The plan was always in place, but that doesn't make it any good. It's a total cop-out and a reveal that cheapens H2O's story. After the reveal, Michael stalks Lori and, surprise, he finally kills her because Lori's an idiot now. With that, Curtis was finally free from the franchise she had moved past for so long soured on how Akkad and team had duped her with H2O. Of course, we all know she wouldn't truly be done, but that's a story for another video. With Lori gone, Resurrection is free to do whatever it wants with suddenly new ground, and what we get is garbage. Resurrection's crappiness isn't because of a lack of Lori, but I find it fascinating that this is the only Michael-focused Halloween without a Strode connection. So, without a hook to hang the film on, we get characters with no backstory, no motivations, all wrapped in a very silly live web show. Dangertainment, led by Busta Rhymes and Tyra Banks, recruits some hot young co-eds to spend the night in the old Myers house, which is then broadcast on something called the World Wide Web. Of course, Michael returns, and the planned fake scares become very real ones. The entire thing is a mess. Well past dumb fun, and so bad it wraps around past so bad it's good and all the way back to just bad again. At the center is Bianca Kylix, Sarah, whose entire character description is just Final Girl, her stalkerish online friend who watches her every move on the broadcast, Katie Sackhoff being fairly embarrassing, a small group of stock characters who have no real shape, and the true stars of the movie. Resurrection was also subjected to extensive rewrites and reshoots that added much more Busta Rhymes kung fu, making him the star of the finale instead of Kylix's character, and generally chopping any and all character arcs into a fine powder. It's a thuddingly bad film that feels like no one had any motivation to do anything other than put something out that fit on a movie screen, and could be legally titled Halloween something. I mean it when I say Halloween Resurrection is an incompetently made movie. Everything from shot composition to sound effects to character motivations are terrible. Who are these people? Why the Myers house? Did Michael hire a contractor for these underground tunnels? What has Michael been up to? Why did Laurie have to be locked up in a sanitarium? Is this supposed to be funny? The only somewhat memorable aspect is Busta as Freddie Harris, who is essentially a less talented Zach Baggins, which is really saying something. And the choice to constantly switch to low-grade digital POV footage also makes it really just confusing to look at. In reality, this would be the most boring ghost adventure ever. We're supposed to spend the entire night searching this place? It's a two-story Pasadena Craftsman, guys. Not the Baker Estate from RE7. It's not that hard to explore. There are many ways in which Resurrection totally jumps the pumpkin-flavored shark. Lori's death, Michael's secret underground tunnels, the moment I'm contractually obligated to include in every Halloween video. Trick or treat, motherfucker. But really, it's the overall air of giving up that makes Resurrection such a low point. A movie that has truly run out of ideas and knows that we know it. Oh, and this mask is butt cheeks too. Looks like Michael's holding in a dookie. It all ends with Busta making some truly insightful remarks about the nature of the shape. Wow, I haven't called him that all video. 
this truly is just some dude in a jumpsuit. Michael Myers is a killer shark. Baggy ass overalls. When Dimension bought the rights to Halloween, they intended to turn it into a straight-to-video factory like Hellraiser. H2O saved the franchise from that fate, but Resurrection reeks of the blockbuster shelf. Audiences could smell it too. And while this eighth Halloween movie had a slightly smaller budget of $15 million, it only made $37.6 million, a steep decline from H2O. The writing was once again on the wall for the Halloween franchise. Dead end again. This has to be the strangest and most frustrating period of the series, hitting on the zeitgeist only to throw it all away. H2O came at a turning point for horror, not just taking advantage of the new wave, but even having the man responsible for it behind the scenes. Say what you will about the overall success rate of the 20 years later sequel, but it hit right when it was supposed to and feels light years removed from Curse of Michael Myers, when it's actually only two years apart. Resurrection, on the other hand, is infamous in the franchise for its destruction of the series. Years later, when discussing coming back for David Gordon Green's relaunch, series creator John Carpenter said, I watched the one in that house, with all the cameras. Oh my god. Oh lord. God. And then the guy gives the speech at the end about violence. What the hell? Oh my lord. I couldn't believe. Love you, John. So looking back, is wiping out select films from a franchise to justify a sequel worth it in the long run? Your opinion on that choice may vary depending on your opinions of films like H2O. However, it's clear that while the resurgence might be strong, it's likely brief, as erasing sequels from canon doesn't mean you erase them from the minds of viewers. The well has still run dry, even if you pretend it hasn't. Halloween would return to the idea of a pick-and-choose legacy sequel after another 20 years. But first, the franchise's owners would opt for a more traditional, but far more polarizing decision, a remake. Where the Halloween franchise goes from here is a contentious time that only seems stranger as the series continues. And in the context of Halloween undergoing yet another canon rewriting legacy sequel under David Gordon Green, H2O and Resurrection seem like they've been replaced within their constantly struggling franchise. But for a moment, Halloween, Michael Myers, and Laurie Strode were back on top of the horror world. It just wasn't meant to last. Thanks for watching today's video, and we are once again talking about Halloween. As I slowly cover the franchise with these videos on different entries, I find it fascinating that for a series as iconic as this Michael Myers franchise is, the Halloween series has often lacked any real direction, even in the midst of filming a movie. That's very obvious from the original Halloween 2's creation, where John Carpenter absolutely did not want to make that movie, to Halloween 3, which really spiced up everything in the franchise with a brand new direction, but did very, very poorly, to something like The Revenge of Michael Myers and The Curse of Michael Myers, two very bad movies that are very bad in very different ways. And while I like Halloween H2O, it's clear that even this successful film had so much problems behind the scenes. Always a mini miracle when anything somewhat good comes out of a system like that. And Resurrection? Well, you already heard my thoughts on Resurrection. It's a gigantic mess. And I hope that you're all enjoying this continued trip through the Halloween season, as we continue to cover as many topics as possible before the holiday arrives. I would love to hear your thoughts on Halloween H2O and Resurrection in particular and how you would compare them to something like David Gordon Green's trilogy. As always, a huge shout out to my patrons for their continued support. And if you'd like to be a patron, it's only a dollar a month for early access to every video and exclusive Patreon-only reviews. So until next time, I hope that you're taking care of yourselves and enjoying this spookiest of seasons.